chapter one of crusaders of new france this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org crusaders of new france by william bennett munro chapter one france of the bourbons france when she undertook the creation of a bourbon empire beyond the seas was the first nation of europe her population was larger than that of spain and three times that of england her army in the days of louis quatorze numbering nearly a half million in all ranks was larger than that of rome at the height of the imperial power no nation since the fall of roman supremacy had possessed such resources for conquering and colonizing new lands by the middle of the seventeenth century spain had ceased to be a dangerous rival germany and italy were at the time little more than geographical expressions while england was in the throes of the puritan revolution nor was it only in the arts of war that the hegemony of the bourbon kingdom stood unquestioned in art and education in manners and fashions france also dominated the ideas of the old continent the dictator of social tastes as well as the grim warrior among the nations in the second half of the seventeenth century france might justly claim to be both the heart and the head of europe small wonder it was that the leaders of such a nation should demand to see the clause in adam's will which bequeathed the new world to spain and portugal small wonder indeed that the first nation of europe should insist upon a place in the sun to which her people might go to trade to make land yield its increase and to widen the bourbon sway if ever there was a land able and ready to take up the white man's burden it was the france of louis the fourteenth the power and prestige of france at this time may be traced in the main to three sources first there were the physical features the compactness of the kingdom a fertile soil a propitious climate and a frontage upon two great seas in an age when so much of a nation's wealth came from agriculture these were factors of great importance only in commerce did the french people at this time find themselves outstripped by their neighbors although both the atlantic and the mediterranean bathed the shores of france her people were being outdistanced on the seas by the english and the dutch whose commercial companies were exploiting the wealth of the new continents both east and west yet in france there was food enough for all and to spare it was only because the means of distributing it were so poor that some got more and others less than they required france was supporting at this time a population half as large as that of to-day then there were qualities of race which helped to make the nation great at all periods in their history the french have shown an almost inexhaustible stamina an ability to bear disasters and to rise from them quickly a courage and persistence that no obstacles seem able to thwart how often in the course of the centuries has france been torn apart by internecine strife or thrown prostrate by her enemies only to astonish the world by a superb display of recuperative powers it was france that first among the kingdoms of europe rose from feudal chaos to orderly nationalism it was france that first among continental countries after the middle ages established the reign of law throughout a powerful realm though wars and turmoils almost without end were a heavy drain upon gallic vitality for many generations france achieved steady progress to primacy in the arts of peace none but a marvellous people could have made such efforts without exhaustion yet even now in the twentieth century the astounding vigour of this race has not ceased to compel the admiration of mankind 
in the seventeenth century moreover france owed much of her national power to a highly centralized and closely knit scheme of government under richelieu the strength of the monarchy had been enhanced and the power of the nobility broken when he began his personal rule louis the fourteenth continued his work of consolidation and in the years of his long reign managed to centralize in the throne every vestige of political power the famous saying attributed to him the state i am the state embodied no idle boast nowhere was there a trace of representative government nowhere a constitutional check on the royal power there were councils of different sorts and with varied jurisdictions but men sat in them at the king's behest and were removable at his will there were parlements too but to mention them without explanation would be only to let the term mislead for they were not representative bodies or parliaments in the ordinary sense their powers were chiefly judicial and they were no barrier in the way of the steady march to absolutism the political structure of the bourbon realm in the age of louis the fourteenth and afterwards was simple all the lines of control ran upwards and to a common centre and all this made for unity and autocratic efficiency in finance in war and in foreign affairs another feature which fitted the nation for an imperial destiny was the possession of a united and militant church with heresy the gallican branch of the catholic church had fought a fierce struggle but before the seventeenth century was far advanced the battle had been won there were heretics in france even after richelieu's time but they were no longer a source of serious discord the church now victorious over its foes became militant ready to carry its missionary efforts to other lands ready in fact for a new crusade these four factors rare geographical advantages racial qualities of a high order a strongly centralized scheme of government and a militant church contributed largely to the prestige which france possessed among european nations in the seventeenth century with all these advantages she should have been the first and not the last to get a firm footing in the new continents historians have recorded their reasons why france did not seriously enter the field of american colonization as early as england but these reasons do not impress one as being good foreign wars and internal religious strife are commonly given and accepted as the true cause of french tardiness in following up the pioneer work of jacques cartier and others yet not all the energy of nearly twenty million people was being absorbed in these troubles there were men and money to spare had the importance of the work overseas only been adequately realized the main reason why france was last in the field is to be found in the failure of her kings and ministers to realize until late in the day how vast the possibilities of the new continent really were in a highly centralized and not overpopulated state the authorities must lead the way in colonial enterprises the people will not of their own initiative seek out and follow opportunities to colonize distant lands and in france the authorities were not ready to lead sully who stood supreme among the royal advisers in the closing years of the sixteenth century was opposed to colonial ventures under all circumstances far-off possessions he declared are not suited to the temperament or to the genius of frenchmen who to my great regret have neither the perseverance nor the foresight needed for such enterprises but who ordinarily apply their vigour minds and courage to things which are immediately at hand and constantly before their eyes colonies beyond the seas he believed would never be anything but a great expense that indeed was the orthodox notion in circles surrounding the seat of royal power and it was a difficult notion to dislodge never until the time of richelieu was any intimation of the great colonial opportunity 
now quickly slipping by allowed to reach the throne and then it was only an inkling making but a slight impression and soon virtually forgotten richelieu's great company of sixteen hundred and twenty seven made a brave start but it did not hold the cardinal's interest very long mazarin who succeeded richelieu took no interest in the new world the tortuous problems of european diplomacy appeal far more strongly to his italian imagination than did the vision of a new france beyond the seas it was not until colbert took the reins that official france really displayed an interest in the work of colonization at all proportionate to the nation's power and resources colbert was admirably fitted to become the herald of a greater france coming from the ranks of the bourgeoisie he was a man of affairs not a cleric or a courtier as his predecessors in office had been he had a clear conception of what he wanted and unwearied industry in moving towards the desired end his devotion to the king was beyond question he had native ability patience sound ideas and a firm will given a fair opportunity he would have accomplished far more for the glory of the fleur-de-lis in the region of the st lawrence and the great lakes of america but a thousand problems of home administration were crowded upon him problems of finance of industry of ecclesiastical adjustment and of social reconstruction in the first few years of his term as minister he could still find a little time and thought for canada and during this short period he personally conducted the correspondence with the colonial officials but after sixteen hundred and sixty nine all this was turned over to the minister of marine and colbert himself figured directly in the affairs of the colony no more the great minister of louis the fourteenth is remembered far more for his work at home than for his services to new france as for the french monarchs of the seventeenth century louis the fourteenth was the first and only one to take an active and enduring interest in the great crusade to the northern wilderness he began his personal reign about sixteen hundred and sixty with a genuine display of zeal for the establishment of a colony which would by its rapid growth and prosperity soon crowd the english off the new continent in the selection of officials to carry out his policy his judgment when not subjected to sinister pressure was excellent as shown in his choice of frontenac nor did the king's interest in the colony slacken in the face of discouragement it kept on to the end of his reign although diminishing somewhat towards the close it could not well do otherwise than weaken during the european disasters which marked his later years by the death of louis the fourteenth in seventeen hundred and fifteen the colony lost its most unwavering friend the shrewdest of french historians de tocqueville has somewhere remarked that the physiognomy of a government may be best judged in the colonies when i wish to study the spirit and faults of the administration of louis the fourteenth he writes i must go to canada for its deformity is there seen as through a microscope that is entirely true the history of new france in its picturesque alternation of sunshine and shadow of victory and defeat of pageant and tragedy is a chronicle that is gallic to the core in the early annals of the northland one can find silhouetted in sharp relief examples of all that was best and all that was worst in the life of old france the political framework of the colony with its strict centralization the paternal regulation of industry and commerce the flood of missionary zeal which poured in upon it the heroism and courage of its priests and voyagers the venality of its administrative officials the anachronism of a feudal land tenure the bizarre externals of its social life the versatility of its people all these reflected the paternity of new france the most striking weakness of french colonial policy in the seventeenth century was its failure to realize how vastly different was the environment of north america from that of central europe institutions were transplanted bodily and then amazement was expressed at versailles because they did not seem to thrive in the new soil 
detailed instructions to officials in new france were framed by men who had not the slightest grasp of the colony's needs or problems one busybody wrote to the colonial intendant that a bake oven should be established in every seigneury and that the habitants should be ordered to bring their dough there to be made into bread the intendant had to remind him that in the long cold winters of the st lawrence valley the dough would be frozen stiff if the habitants with their dwellings so widely scattered were required to do anything of the kind another martinet gravely informed the colonial authorities that as a protection against indian attacks all the seigneuries should be palisaded and some of the seigneurial estates were eight or ten miles square the dogmatic way in which the colonial officials were told to do this and that to encourage one thing and to discourage another all by superiors who displayed an astounding ignorance of new world conditions must have been a severe trial to the patience of those hard-working officials who were never without great practical difficulties immediately before their eyes not enough heed was paid moreover to the advice of men who were on the spot it is true that the recommendations sent home to france by the governor and by the intendant were often contradictory but even where the two officials were agreed there was no certainty that their counsel would be taken with greater freedom and discretion the colonial government could have accomplished much more in the way of developing trade and industry but for every step the acquiescence of the home authorities had first to be secured to obtain this consent always entailed a great loss of time and when the approval arrived the opportunity too often had passed from november until may there was absolutely no communication between quebec and paris save that in a great emergency if france and england happened to be at peace a dispatch might be sent by dint of great hardship to boston with a precarious chance that it would get across to the french ambassador in london ordinarily the officials sent their requests for instructions by the home-going vessels from quebec in the autumn and received their answers by the ships which came in the following spring if any plans were formulated after the last ship sailed in october it ordinarily took eighteen months before the royal approval could be had for putting them into effect the routine machinery of paternalism thus ran with exasperating slowness there was however one mitigating feature in the situation the hand of home authority was rigid and its beckonings were precise but as a practical matter it could be and sometimes was disregarded altogether not that the colonial officials ever defied the king or his ministers or ever failed to profess their intent to follow the royal instructions loyally and to the letter they had a much safer plan when the provisions of a royal decree seemed impractical or unwise it was easy enough to let them stand unenforced such decrees were duly registered in the records of the sovereign council at quebec and were then promptly pigeonholed so that no one outside the little circle of officials at the chateau de st louis ever heard of them in one case a new intendant on coming to the colony unearthed a royal mandate of great importance which had been kept from public knowledge for twenty years absolutism paternalism and religious solidarity were characteristic of both france and her colonies in the great century of overseas expansion there was no self-government no freedom of individual initiative and very little heresy either at home or abroad the factors which made france strong in europe her unity her subordination of all other things to the military needs of the nation her fostering of the sense of nationalism these appeared prominently in canada and helped to make the colony strong as well historians of new france have been at pains to explain why the colony ultimately succumbed to the combined attacks of new england by land and of old england by sea for a full century new france had as its next-door neighbor a group of english colonies whose combined populations outnumbered her own at a ratio of about fifteen to one the relative numbers and resources of the two areas were about the same proportionately as those of the united states and canada at the present day the marvel is not that french dominion in america finally came to an end but that it managed to endure so long End of chapter 1
chapter two of crusaders of new france by william bennett munro this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter two a voyageur of brittany the closing quarter of the fifteenth century in europe has usually been regarded by historians as marking the end of the middle ages the era of feudal chaos had drawn to a close and states were being welded together under the leadership of strong dynasties with this consolidation came the desire for expansion for acquiring new lands and for opening up new channels of influence spain portugal and england were first in the field of active exploration searching for stores of precious metals and for new routes to the coasts of ormuz and of india in this quest for a short route to the half fabulous empires of asia they had literally stumbled upon a new continent which they had made haste to exploit france meanwhile was dissipating her energies on spanish and italian battlefields it was not until the peace of cambrai in fifteen hundred and twenty nine ended the struggle with spain that france gave any attention to the work of gaining some foothold in the new world by that time spain had become firmly entrenched in the lands which border the caribbean sea her galleons were already bearing home their rich cargoes of silver bullion portugal england and even holland had already turned with zeal to the exploration of new lands in the east and the west french fishermen it is true were lengthening their voyages to the west every year now the rugged old norman and breton seaports were sending their fleets of small vessels to gather the harvests of the sea but official france took no active interest in the regions towards which they went five years after the peace of cambrai the breton port of st malo became the starting point of the first french voyageur to the st lawrence francis i had been persuaded to turn his thoughts from gaming and gallantries to the trading prospects of his kingdom with the result that in fifteen hundred and thirty four jacques cartier was able to set out on his first voyage of discovery cartier is described in the records of the time as a corsair which means that he had made a business of roving the seas to despoil the enemies of france st malo his birthplace and home on the coast of brittany faces the english channel somewhat south of jersey the nearest of the channel islands the town is set on high ground which projects out into the sea forming an almost landlocked harbour where ships may ride at ease during the most tumultuous gales it had long been a notable nursery of hardy fishermen and adventurous navigators men who had pressed their way to all the coasts of europe and beyond cartier was one of these hardy sailors his fathers before him had been mariners and he had himself learned the way of the great waters while yet a mere youth before his expedition of fifteen hundred and thirty four jacques cartier had probably made a voyage to brazil and had in all probability more than once visited the newfoundland fishing banks although when he sailed from st malo to become the pathfinder of a new bourbon imperialism he was forty-three years of age and in the prime of his days we know very little of his youth and early manhood it is enough that he had attained the rank of a master pilot and that from his skill in seamanship he was considered the most dependable man in all the kingdom to serve his august sovereign in this important enterprise cartier shipped his crew at st malo and on the twentieth of april fifteen hundred and thirty four headed his two small ships across the great atlantic his company numbered only three score souls in all favoured by steady winds his vessels made good progress and within three weeks he sighted the shores of newfoundland where he put into one of the many small harbours to rest and refit his ships then turning northward the expedition passed through the straits of belle isle and into the gulf of st lawrence coasting along the northern shore of the gulf for a short distance 
cartier headed his ships due southward keeping close to the western shore of the great island almost its whole length he then struck across the lower gulf and moving northward once more reached the bay des chaleurs on the sixth of july here the boats were sent to shore and the french were able to do a little trading with the indians about a week later cartier went northward once more and soon sought shelter from a violent gulf storm by anchoring in gaspe bay on the headland there he planted a great wooden cross with the arms of france the first symbol of bourbon dominion in the new land and the same symbol that successive explorers chanting the vexilla regis were in time to set aloft from the gulf of st lawrence to the gulf of mexico it was the augury of the white man's coming crossing next to the southerly shore of anticosti the voyageurs almost circled the island until the constant and adverse winds which cartier met in the gradually narrowing channel forced him to defer indefinitely his hope of finding a western passage and he therefore headed his ships back to belle isle it was now mid-august and the season of autumnal storms was drawing near cartier had come to explore to search for a westward route to the indies to look for precious metals not to establish a colony he accordingly decided to set sail for home and with favouring winds was able to reach st malo in the early days of september in one sense the voyage of fifteen hundred and thirty four had been a failure no stores of mineral wealth had been discovered and no short route to cipango or cathay yet the spirit of exploration had been awakened cartier's recital of his voyage had aroused the interest of both the king and his people so that the navigator's request for better equipment to make another voyage was readily granted on may nineteenth fifteen hundred and thirty five cartier once more set forth from st malo this time with three vessels and with a royal patent empowering him to take possession of new lands in his sovereign's name with cartier on this voyage there were over one hundred men of whom the majority were hardened maluans veterans of the sea how he found accommodation for all of them with supplies and provisions in three small vessels whose total burden was only two hundred and twenty tons is not least among the mysteries of this remarkable voyage the trip across the ocean was boisterous and the clumsy caravels had a hard time breasting the waves the ships were soon separated by alternate storms and fog so that all three did not meet at their appointed rendezvous in the straits of belle isle until the last week in july then moving westward along the north shore of the gulf they passed anticosti crossed to the gaspe shore circle back as far as the mingan islands and then resumed a westward course up the great river as the vessels stemmed the current but slowly it was well into september when they cast anchor before the indian village of stadacona which occupied the present site of lower quebec since it was now too late in the season to think of returning at once to france cartier decided to spend the winter at this point two of the ships were therefore drawn into the mouth of a brook which entered the river just below the village while the frenchman established acquaintance with the savages and made preparations for a trip farther up the river in the smallest vessel using as interpreters two young indians whom he had captured in the gaspe region during his first voyage in the preceding year cartier was able to learn from the indians at stadacona that there was another settlement of importance at hocha laga now montreal the navigator decided to use the remaining days of autumn in a visit to this settlement although the stadacona indians strenuously objected declaring that there were all manner of dangers and difficulties in the way with his smallest vessel and about half of his men cartier however made his way up the river during the last fortnight in september near the point where the largest of the st lawrence rapids bars the river gateway to the west the frenchman found hokalaga nestling between the mountain and the shore in the midst of goodly and large fields full of corn such as the country yieldeth 
the indian village which consisted of about fifty houses was encircled by three courses of palisades one within the other the natives received their visitors with great cordiality and after a liberal distribution of trinkets the french learned from them some vague snatches of information about the rivers and great lakes which lay to the westward where a man might travel on the face of the waters for many moons in the same direction but as winter was near cartier found it necessary to hurry back to stadacona where the remaining members of his expedition had built a small fort or habitation during his absence everything was made ready for the long season of cold and snow but the winter came on with unusual severity the neighbouring indians grew so hostile that the french hardly dared to venture from their narrow quarters supplies ran low and to make matters worse the pestilence of scurvy came upon the camp in february almost the entire company was stricken down and nearly one quarter of them had died before the emaciated survivors learned from the indians that the bark of a white spruce tree boiled in water would afford a cure the frenchmen dosed themselves with the indian remedy using a whole tree in less than a week but with such revivifying results that cartier hailed the discovery as a genuine miracle when spring appeared the remnant of the company now restored to health and vigour gladly began their preparations for a return to france there was no ardour among them for a further exploration of this inhospitable land as there were not enough men to handle all three of the ships they abandoned one of them whose timbers were uncovered from the mud-bank in eighteen hundred and forty three more than three centuries later before leaving stadacona however cartier decided to take donnacona the head of the village and several other indians as presents to the french king it was natural enough that the master pilot should wish to bring his sovereign some impressive souvenir from the new domains yet this sort of treachery and ingratitude was unpardonable donnacona and all these captives but one little indian maiden died in france and his people did not readily forget the lesson of european duplicity by july the expedition was back in the harbour of st malo and cartier was promptly at work preparing for the king a journal of his experiences cartier's account of his voyage which has come down to us contains many interesting details concerning the topography and life of the new land the maloan captain was a good navigator as seafaring went in his day a good judge of distance at sea and a keen observer of landmarks but he was not a discriminating chronicler of those things which we would now wish to understand for example the relationship and status of the various indian tribes with which he came into contact all manner of indian customs are superficially described particularly those which presented to the french the aspect of novelty but we are left altogether uncertain as to whether the indians of stadacona in cartier's time were of huron or iroquois or algonquin stock the navigator did not describe with sufficient clearness or with a due differentiation of the important from the trivial those things which ethnologists would now like to know it must have been a disappointment not to be able to lay before the king any promise of great mineral wealth to be found in the new territory while at hochelaga cartier had gleaned from the savages some vague allusions to sources of silver and copper in the far northwest but that was all he had not found a northern el dorado nor had his quest of a new route to the indies been a whit more fruitful cartier had set out with this as his main motive but had succeeded only in finding that there was no such route by way of the st lawrence though the king was much interested in his recital of courage and hardships he was not fired with zeal for spending good money in the immediate equipping of another expedition to these inhospitable shores not for five years after his return in fifteen hundred and thirty six therefore did cartier again set out for the st lawrence this time his sponsor was the sieur de roberval a nobleman of picardy who had acquired an ambition to colonize a portion of the new territory and who had obtained the royal endorsement of his scheme the royal patronage was not difficult to obtain when no funds were sought accordingly in fifteen hundred and forty robert val who was duly appointed viceroy of the country enlisted the assistance of cartier in carrying out his plans 
it was arranged that cartier with three ships should sail from st malo in the spring of fifteen hundred and forty one while roberval's part of the expedition should set forth at the same time from honfleur but when may arrived roberval was not ready and cartier's ships set sail alone with the understanding that roberval would follow cartier in due course reached newfoundland where for six weeks he awaited his viceroy at length his patience exhausted he determined to push on alone to stadacona where he arrived toward the end of august the ships were unloaded and two of the vessels were sent back to france the rest of the expedition prepared to winter at cap rouge a short distance above the settlement once more cartier made a short trip up the river to hochelaga but with no important incidents and here the voyageur's journal comes to an end he may have written more but if so the pages have never been found henceforth the evidence as to his doings is less extensive and less reliable on his return he and his band seem to have passed the winter at cap rouge more comfortably than the first hibernation six years before for the french had now learned the winter hygiene of the northern regions the indians however grew steadily more hostile as the months went by and cartier fearing that his small following might not fare well in the event of a general assault deemed it wise to start for france when the river opened in the spring of fifteen hundred and forty two cartier set sail from quebec in may taking the southern route through the gulf he entered early in june the harbour of what is now st john's newfoundland there according to hacklet the breton navigator and his belated viceroy roberval anchored their ships side by side roberval who had been delayed nearly a year was now on his way to join cartier at quebec and had put into the newfoundland harbour to refit his ships after a stormy voyage what passed between the two on the occasion of this meeting will never be known with certainty we have only the brief statement that after a spirited interview cartier was ordered by his chief to turn his ships about and accompany the expedition back to quebec instead of doing so he spread his sails during the night and slipped homeward to st malo leaving the viceroy to his own resources there are difficulties in the way of accepting this story however although it is not absolutely inconsistent with the official records as some later historians seem to have assumed at any rate it was in no pleasant humour that roberval now proceeded to the st lawrence and up to cap rouge where he took possession of cartier's post sowed some grain and vegetables and endeavoured to prepare for the winter his company of followers having been recruited from the jails of france proved as unruly as might have been expected discipline and order could only be maintained by the exercise of great severity one of the malefactors was executed others were given the lash in generous measure the winter moreover proved to be terribly cold supplies ran low and the scurvy once again got beyond control if anything the conditions were even worse than those which cartier had to endure seven years before when spring arrived the survivors had no thought of anything but a prompt return to france but roberval bade most of them wait until with a small party he ventured a trip to the territory near what is now three rivers and the mouth of the st maurice apparently the whole party made its way safely back to france before the autumn but as to how or when we have no record there is some evidence that cartier was sent out with a relief expedition in fifteen hundred and forty three but in any case both he and roberval were in france during the spring of the next year for they then appeared there in court to settle respective accounts of expenses incurred in the badly managed enterprise of cartier's later life little is known save that he lived at st malo until he died in fifteen hundred and fifty seven with the exception of his journals which cover only a part of his explorations none of his writings or maps has come down to us that he prepared maps is highly probable for he was an explorer in the royal service but diligent search on the part of antiquarians has not brought them to light his portrait in the town hall at st malo shows us a man of firm and strong features with jaws tight set a high forehead and penetrating eyes unhappily it is of relatively recent workmanship and as a likeness of the great maloin its trustworthiness is at least questionable fearless and untiring however his own indisputable achievements amply prove him to have been 
the tasks set before him were difficult to perform he was often in tight places and he came through unscathed as a navigator he possessed a skill that ranked with the best of his time he was an intrepid sailor soul if his voyages resulted in no permanent establishment that was not altogether cartier's fault he was sent out on his first two voyages as an explorer to find new trade routes or stores of gold and silver or a rich land to exploit on his third voyage when a scheme of colonization was in hand the failure of roberval to do his part proved the undoing of the entire plan there is no reason to believe that faint-heartedness or lack of courage had any place in cartier's sturdy frame for sixty years following the ill-starred ventures of fifteen hundred and forty one through fifteen hundred and forty two no serious attempts were made to gain for france any real footing in the regions of the st lawrence this is not altogether surprising for there were troubles in plenty at home huguenots and catholics had ranged themselves in civil strife the wars of the fronde were convulsing the land and it was not until the very end of the sixteenth century that france settled down to peace within her own borders norman and breton fishermen continued their yearly trips to the fishing banks but during the whole latter half of the sixteenth century no vessel so far as we know ever made its way beyond the saguenay some schemes of colonization without official support were launched during this interval but in all such cases the expeditions set forth to warmer lands to brazil and to florida in neither direction however did any marked success attend these praiseworthy examples of private initiative the great valley of the st lawrence during these six decades remained a land of mystery the navigators of europe still clung to the vision of a westward passage whose eastern portal must be hidden among the bays or estuaries of this silent land but none was bold or persevering enough to seek it to the end as for the great continent itself europe had not the slightest inkling of what it held in store for future generations of mankind End of chapter 2chapter three of crusaders of new france by william bennett munro this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three the founding of new france in the closing years of the sixteenth century the spirit of french expansion which had remained so strangely inactive for nearly three generations once again began to manifest itself the sieur de la roche another breton nobleman the merchant traders pontgrave of st malo and chauvin of honfleur came forward one after the other with plans for colonizing the unknown land unhappily these plans were not easily matured into stern realities the ambitious project of la roche came to grief on the barren sands of sable island the adventurous merchants for their part obtained a monopoly of the trade and for a few years exploited the rich peltry regions of the st lawrence but they made no serious attempts at actual settlement finally they lost the monopoly which passed in sixteen hundred and three to the sieur de chaste a royal favourite and commandant at dieppe it is at this point that samuel champlain first becomes associated with the pioneer history of new france given the opportunity to sail with an expedition which de chast sent out in sixteen hundred and three champlain gladly accepted and from this time to the end of his days he never relaxed his whole-souled interest in the design to establish a french dominion in these western lands with his accession to the ranks of the voyageurs real progress in the field of colonization was for the first time assured champlain encountered many setbacks during his initial years as a colonizer but he persevered to the end 
when he had finished his work france had obtained a footing in the st lawrence valley which was not shaken for nearly a hundred and fifty years champlain was born in fifteen hundred and sixty seven at the seaport of brouage on the bay of biscay so that he was only thirty-six years of age when he set out on his first voyage to america his forebears belonged to the lesser gentry of st tong and from them he inherited a roving strain long before reaching middle manhood he had learned to face dangers both as a soldier in the wars of the league and as a sailor to the spanish main with a love of adventure he combined rare powers of description so much so that the narrative of his early voyages to this region had attracted the king's attention and had won for him the title of royal geographer his ideas were bold and clear he had an inflexible will and great patience in battling with discouragements possessing these qualities champlain was in every way fitted to become the founder of new france the expedition of sixteen hundred and three proceeded to the st lawrence where some of the party landed at the mouth of the saguenay to trade with the indians the remainder including champlain made their way up the river to the indian village at hochelaga which they now found in ruins savage warfare having turned the place into a solitude champlain busied himself with some study of the country's resources and the customs of the aborigines but on the whole the prospects of the st lawrence valley did not move the explorers to enthusiasm descending the great river again they rejoined their comrades at the saguenay and taking their cargoes of furs aboard the whole party sailed back to france in the autumn there they found that de chaste the sponsor for their enterprise had died during their absence the death of de chaste upset matters badly for with it the trade monopoly had lapsed but things were promptly set right again by a royal act which granted the monopoly anew this time it went to the sieur de mont a prominent huguenot nobleman then governor of pont with whom champlain was on friendly terms to quiet the clamours of rival traders however it was stipulated that mont should organize a company and should be bound to take into his enterprise any who might wish to associate themselves with him the company in return for its trading monopoly was to transport to the new domains at least one hundred settlers each year little difficulty was encountered in organizing the company since various merchants of st malo honfleur rouen and rochelle were eager to take shares preparations for sending out an expedition on a much larger scale than on any previous occasion were soon under way and in sixteen a hundred and four two well-equipped vessels set forth one of them went to the old trading-post at the saguenay the other went southward to the regions of acadia on board the latter were Mont himself champlain as chief geographer and a young adventurer from the ranks of the noblesse bien cur du potrin cour the personnel of this expedition was excellent it contained no convicts most of its members were artisans and sturdy yeomen rounding the tip of the nova scotian peninsula these vessels came to anchor in the haven of port royal now annapolis not satisfied with the prospects there however they coasted around the bay of fundy and finally reached the island in passamaquoddy bay which they named st croix here on june twenty five sixteen hundred and four the party decided to found their settlement work on the buildings was at once commenced and soon the little colony was safely housed in the autumn poutrincourt was dispatched with one vessel and a crew back to france while champlain and the rest prepared to spend the winter in their new island home <laughs> 
the choice of st croix as a location proved singularly unfortunate the winter was long and severe and the preparations that had been made were soon found to be inadequate once more there were sufferings such as cartier and his men had undergone during the terrible winter of fifteen hundred and thirty four to fifteen hundred and thirty five at quebec there were no brooks or springs close at hand and no fresh water except such as could be had by melting snow the storehouse had no cellar and in consequence the vegetables froze so that the company was reduced to salted meat as the chief staple of diet scurvy ravaged the camp and before the snows melted nearly two-fifths of the party had died not until june moreover did a vessel arrive from france with fresh stores and more colonists the experience of this first winter must have indeed produced discontent as champlain rather mildly expressed it but it did not impel de mont to abandon his plans st croix however was given up and after a futile search for a better location on the new england coast the colony moved across the bay to port royal where the buildings were reconstructed in the autumn de mont went back to france leaving champlain pont grave and forty-three others to spend the winter of sixteen hundred and five to sixteen hundred and six in acadia during this hibernation the fates were far more kind the season proved milder the bitter lessons of the previous season had not gone unlearned and scurvy did not make serious headway but when june came and de mont had not returned from france with fresh supplies there was general discouragement so much so that plans for the entire abandonment of the place were on the eve of being carried out when a large vessel rounded the point on its way into the basin aboard were pontrecourt and marc lescarbot together with more settlers and supplies lescarbot was a parisian lawyer in search of adventure a man who combined wit with wisdom one of the pleasantest figures in the annals of american colonization he was destined to gain a place in literary history as the interesting chronicler of this little colony's all too brief existence these arrivals put new heart into the men and they set to work sowing grain and vegetables which grew in such abundance that the storehouses were filled to their capacity the ensuing winter found the company with an ample store of everything the season of ice and snow passed quickly thanks largely to champlain's successful endeavor to keep the colonists in good health and spirits by exercise by variety in diet and by divers gaieties under the auspices of his ordre de bon temps a spontaneous social organization created for the purpose of banishing cares and worries from the little settlement it seemed as though the colony had been established to stay but with the spring of sixteen hundred and seven came news which quickly put an end to all this optimism rival merchants had been clamouring against the monopoly of the de mont company despite the fact that de mont was a huguenot and thus a shining target for the shafts of bigotry these protests had for three years failed to move the king but now they had gained their point and the monopoly had come to an end this meant that there would be no more ships with settlers or supplies as the colony could not yet hope to exist on its own resources there was no alternative but to abandon the site and return to france and this the whole party reluctantly proceeded to do on arrival in france the affairs of the company were wound up and de mont found himself a heavy loser he was not yet ready to quit the game however and champlain with the aid of pont grave was able to convince him that a new venture in the st lawrence region might yield profits even without the protection of a monopoly thus out of misfortune and failure arose the plans which led to the founding of a permanent outpost of empire at quebec 
in the spring of sixteen hundred and eight champlain and pont grave once again set sail for the st lawrence the latter delayed at the saguenay to trade while champlain pushed on to the site of the old stadacona where at the foot of the cliff he laid the foundations of the new quebec the first permanent settlement of europeans in the territory of new france on the shore below the rocky steep several houses were built and measures were taken to defend them in case of an indian attack here champlain's party spent the winter of sixteen hundred and eight to sixteen hundred and nine with the experience gained at st croix and port royal it should have been possible to provide for all eventualities yet difficulties in profusion were encountered during these winter months first there was the unearthing of a conspiracy against champlain those concerned in it were speedily punished but the execution of the chief culprit gave to the new settlement a rather ominous beginning then came a season of zero weather and the scurvy came with it champlain had heard of the remedy used by cartier but the tribes which had been at stadacona in cartier's time had now disappeared and there was no one to point out the old-time remedy to the suffering garrison so the scourge went on unchecked the ravages of disease were so severe that when a relief ship arrived in the early summer of sixteen hundred and nine all but eight of champlain's party had succumbed yet there was no thought of abandoning the settlement the beginnings of canada made astounding demands upon the fortitude and stamina of these dauntless voyageurs but their store of courage was far from the point of exhaustion they were ready not only to stay but to explore the territory inland to traverse its rivers and lakes to trudge through its forests afoot that they might find out for the king's information what resources the vast land held in its silent expanses after due deliberation therefore it was decided that champlain and four others should accompany a party of huron and algonquin indians upon one of their forays into the country of the iroquois this being the only way in which the frenchmen could be sure of their red-skin guides so the new allies set forth to the southeastward passing up the richelieu river and traversing the lake which now bears his name champlain and his indian friends came upon a war-party of iroquois near ticonderoga and a forest fight ensued the muskets of the french terrified the enemy tribesmen and they fled in disorder in itself the incident was not of much account nor were its consequences so far-reaching as some historians would have us believe it is true that champlain's action put the french for the moment in the bad graces of the iroquois but the conclusion that this foray was chiefly responsible for the hostility of the great tribes during the whole ensuing century is altogether without proper historical foundation revenge has always been a prominent trait of redskin character but it could never of itself have determined the alignment of the five nations against the french during a period of nearly eight generations from the situation of their territories the iroquois were the natural allies of the english and dutch on the one hand and the natural foes of the french on the other trade soon became the alpha and the omega of all tribal diplomacy and the iroquois were discerning enough to realize that their natural role was to serve as middlemen between the western indians and the english their very livelihood indeed depended on their success in diverting the flow of the fur trade through the iroquois territories for by the middle of the seventeenth century there were no beavers left in their own country such a situation meant that they must promote trade between the western indians and the english at albany but to promote trade with the english meant friendship with the english and friendship with the english meant enmity with the french 
here is the true key to the long series of quarrels in which the five nations and new france engaged champlain's little escapade at ticonderoga was a mere incident and the iroquois would have soon forgotten it if their economic interests had required them to do so trade and peace said an iroquois chief to the french on one occasion we take to be one thing he was right they have been one thing in all ages as companions trade and the flag have been inseparable in all lands the expedition of sixteen hundred and nine had however some results besides the discomfiture of an iroquois raiding party it disclosed to the french a water route which led almost to the upper reaches of the hudson the spot where champlain put the iroquois to flight is within thirty leagues of albany it was by this route that the french and english came so often into warring contact during the next one hundred and fifty years explorations the care of his little settlement at quebec trading operations and two visits to france occupied champlain's attention during the next few years down to this time no white man's foot had ever trodden the vast wilderness beyond the rapids above hochelaga stories had filtered through concerning great waters far to the west and north of hidden minerals there and of fertile lands champlain was determined to see these things for himself and it was to that end that he made his two great trips to the interior in sixteen hundred and thirteen and sixteen hundred and sixteen respectively the expedition of sixteen hundred and thirteen was not a journey of indefinite exploration it had a very definite end in view a few years previously champlain had sent into the villages of the algonquins on the upper ottawa river a young frenchman named vignot in order that by living for a time among these people he might learn their language and become useful as an interpreter in sixteen hundred and twelve vignot came back with a marvellous story concerning a trip which he had made with his algonquin friends to the great north sea where he had seen the wreck of an english vessel this striking news inflamed champlain's desire to find out whether this was not the route for which both cartier and he himself had so eagerly searched the western passage to cathay and the indies there is evidence that the explorer from the first doubted the truth of vignot's story but in sixteen hundred and thirteen he decided to make sure and started up the ottawa river taking the young man with him to point the way after a fatiguing journey the party at length reached the algonquin encampment on allumet island in the upper ottawa where his doubts were fully confirmed vignot the algonquins assured champlain was an impostor he had never been out of their sight had never seen a great north sea the english shipwreck was a figment of his imagination overcome with wrath writes champlain i had him removed from my presence being unable to bear the sight of him the party went no further but returned to quebec as for the impostor the generosity of his leader in the end allowed him to go unpunished though the expedition had been in one sense a fool's errand and champlain felt himself badly duped yet it was not without its usefulness for it gave him an opportunity to learn much concerning the methods of wilderness travel the customs of the indians and the extent to which they might be relied upon the algonquins and the hurons had proved their friendship but what they most desired it now appeared was that the french should give them substantial aid in another expedition against the iroquois this was the basis upon which arrangements were made for champlain's next journey to the interior the longest and most daring enterprise in his whole career of exploration in sixteen hundred and fifteen the brouage navigator with a small party once again ascended the ottawa crossed to lake nipissing and thence made his way down the french river to the georgian bay or lake of the hurons as it was then called near the shores of the bay he found the villages of the hurons with the recollet father le caron already at work among the tribesmen 
adding a large band of indians to his party the explorer now struck southeast and by following the chain of small lakes and rivers which lie between matchedash bay and the bay of kinte he eventually reached lake ontario the territory pleased champlain greatly and he recorded his enthusiastic opinion of its fertility crossing the head of lake ontario in their canoes the party then headed for the country of the iroquois south of oneida lake where lay a palisaded village of the onondagas this they attacked but after three hours fighting were repulsed champlain being wounded in the knee by an iroquois arrow the eleven frenchmen with their horde of indians then retreated cautiously but the onondagas made no serious attempt at pursuit and in due course champlain with his party recrossed lake ontario safely the frenchmen were now eager to get back to quebec by descending the st lawrence but their indian allies would not hear of this desertion the whole expedition therefore plodded on to the shores of the georgian bay following a route somewhat north of the one by which it had come there the frenchmen spent a tedious winter champlain was anxious to make use of the time by exploring the upper lakes but the task of settling some wretched feuds among his huron and algonquin friends took most of his time and energy the winter gave him opportunity however to learn a great deal more about the daily life of the savages their abodes their customs their agriculture their amusements and their folk-lore all this information went into his journals and would have been of priceless value had not the jesuits who came later proved to be such untiring chroniclers of every detail when spring came champlain left the huron country and by way of lake nipissing and the ottawa once more reached his own people at quebec it took him forty days to make the journey from the georgian bay to the present site of montreal arriving at quebec where he was hailed as one risen from the dead champlain found that things in france had taken a new turn they had in fact taken many twists and turns during the nine years since de Mont had financed the first voyage to the st lawrence in the first place de Mont had lost the last vestige of his influence at court as a huguenot he could not expect to have retained it under the stern regency which followed the assassination of henry the fourth in sixteen hundred and ten then a half-dozen makeshift arrangements came in the ensuing years it was always the same story faithfully repeated in its broad outlines some friendly nobleman would obtain from the king appointment as viceroy of new france and at the same time a trading monopoly for a term of years always promising to send out some settlers in return the monopoly would then be sublet and champlain would be recognized as a sort of viceroy's deputy and all for a colony in which the white population did not yet number fifty souls despite the small population however champlain's task at quebec was difficult and exacting his sponsors in france had no interest in the permanent upbuilding of the colony they sent out very few settlers and gave him little in the way of funds the traders who came to the st lawrence each summer were an unruly and boisterous crew who quarrelled with the indians and among themselves at times indeed champlain was sorely tempted to throw up the undertaking in disgust but his patience held out until sixteen hundred and twenty seven when the rise of richelieu in france put the affairs of the colony upon a new and more active basis for a quarter of a century france had been letting golden opportunities slip by while the colonies and trade of her rivals were forging ahead spain and portugal were secure in the south england had gained firm footholds both in virginia and on massachusetts bay even holland had a strong commercial company in the field this was a situation which no far-sighted frenchman could endure hence cardinal richelieu when he became chief minister of louis the thirteenth undertook to see that france should have her share of new world spoils no realm is so well situated as france he declared to be mistress of the seas or so rich in all things needful 
the cardinal minister combined fertility in ideas with such a genius for organization that his plans were quickly under way unhappily his talent for details for the efficient handling of little things was not nearly so great and some of his arrangements went sadly awry in consequence at any rate richelieu in sixteen hundred and twenty seven prevailed upon the king to abolish the office of viceroy to cancel all trading privileges and to permit the organization of a great colonizing company one that might hope to rival the english and dutch commercial organizations this was formed under the name of the company of new france or the company of one hundred associates as it was more commonly called from the fact that its membership was restricted to one hundred shareholders each of whom contributed three thousand livres the cardinal himself the ministers of state noblemen and courtesans of paris as well as merchants of the port towns all figured in the list of stockholders the subscription lists contained an imposing array of names the powers of the new company moreover were as imposing as its personnel to it was granted a perpetual monopoly of the fur trade and of all other commerce with rights of suzerainty over all the territories of new france and acadia it was to govern these lands levy taxes establish courts appoint officials and even bestow titles of nobility in return the company undertook to convey to the colony not less than two hundred settlers per year to provide them with subsistence until they could become self-supporting it was stipulated however that no huguenots or other heretics should be among the immigrants the hundred associates entered upon this portentous task with promptness and enthusiasm early in sixteen hundred and twenty eight a fleet of eighteen vessels freighted with equipment settlers and supplies set sail from dieppe for the st lawrence to begin operations but the time of its arrival was highly inopportune for france was now at war with england and it happened that a fleet of english privateers was already seeking prey in the lower st lawrence these privateers commanded by kirk intercepted the company's heavily laden caravels overpowered them and carried their prizes off to england thus the company of the one hundred associates lost a large part of its capital and its shareholders received a generous dividend of disappointment in the very first year of its operations a more serious blow however was yet to come flushed with his success in sixteen hundred and twenty eight kirk came back to the st lawrence during the next summer and proceeded to quebec where he summoned champlain and his little settlement to surrender as the place was on the verge of famine owing to the capture of the supply ships in the previous year there was no alternative but to comply and the colony passed for the first time into english hands champlain was allowed to sail for england where he sought the services of the french ambassador and earnestly advised that the king be urged to insist on the restoration of canada whenever the time for peace should come negotiations for peace soon began but they dragged on tediously until sixteen hundred and thirty two when the treaty of st germain en laye gave back new france to its former owners with this turn in affairs the company was able to resume its operations champlain as its representative once more reached quebec where he received a genuine welcome from the few frenchmen who had remained through the years of babylonian captivity and from the bands of neighboring indians with his hands again set to the arduous tasks champlain was able to make substantial progress during the next two years for a time the company gave him funds and equipment besides sending him some excellent colonists lands were cleared in the neighborhood of the settlement buildings were improved and enlarged trade with the indians was put upon a better basis a post was established at three rivers and plans were made for a further extension of french influence to the westward it was in the midst of these achievements and hopes that champlain was stricken by paralysis and died on christmas day sixteen hundred and thirty five champlain's portrait attributed to montcornet shows us a sturdy broad-shouldered frame with features in keeping 
unhappily we have no assurance that it is a faithful likeness no one however can deny that the mariner of brouage with his extraordinary perseverance and energy was admirably fitted to be the pathfinder to a new realm not often does one encounter in the annals of any nation a man of greater tenacity and patience chagrin and disappointment he had to meet on many occasions but he was never baffled nor moved to concede defeat his perseverance however was not greater than his modesty for never in his writings did he magnify his difficulties nor exalt his own powers of overcoming them as was too much the fashion of his day as a writer his style was plain and direct with no attempt at embellishment and no indication that strong emotions ever had much influence upon his pen he was essentially a man of action and his narrative is in the main a simple record of such a man's achievements his character was above reproach no one ever impugned his honesty or his sincere devotion to the best interests of his superiors to his church he was loyal in the last degree and it was under his auspices that the first of the jesuit missionaries came to begin the enduring work which the order was destined to accomplish in new france on the death of champlain the company appointed the sieur de montmagny to be governor of the colony he was an ardent sympathizer with the aims of the jesuits and life at quebec soon became almost monastic in its austerity the jesuits sent home each year their relations and as these were widely read they created great interest in the spiritual affairs of the colony the call for zealots to carry the cross westward into the wilderness met ready response and it was amid a glow of religious fervor that the settlement at montreal was brought into being a company was formed in france funds were obtained and a band of forty-four colonists was recruited for the crusade into the wilderness the sieur de maisonneuve a gallant soldier and a loyal devotee of the church was the active leader of the enterprise with jean mans an ardent young religionist of high motives and fine character as his principal coadjutor fortune dealt kindly with the project and montreal began its history in sixteen hundred and forty two a few years later montmagny gave up his post and returned to france with the limited resources at his disposal he had served the colony well and had left it stronger and more prosperous than when he came his successor was m d'ailleboust who had been for some time in the country and who was consequently no stranger to its needs on his appointment a council was created to consist of the governor of the colony the bishop or the superior of the jesuits and the governor of montreal henceforth this body was to be responsible for the making of all general regulations it is commonly called the old council to distinguish it from the sovereign council by which it was supplanted in sixteen hundred and sixty three the opening years of the new administration were marked by one of the greatest of forest tragedies the destruction of the hurons in sixteen hundred and forty eight a party of iroquois warriors made their way across lake ontario and overland to the huron country where they destroyed one large village emboldened by this success a much larger body of the tribesmen returned in the year following and completed their bloody work a dozen or more huron settlements were attacked and laid waste with wanton slaughter two jesuit priests lalemant and brebeuf who were labouring among the hurons were taken and burned at the stake after suffering atrocious tortures the remnants of the tribe were scattered a few found shelter on the islands of the georgian bay while others took refuge with the french and were given a tract of land at sillery near quebec to the french colony the extirpation of the hurons came as a severe blow it weakened their prestige in the west it cut off a lucrative source of fur supply and it involved the loss of faithful allies more 
ominous still the iroquois by the success of their forays into the huron country endangered the french settlement at montreal glorying in their prowess these warriors now boasted that they would leave the frenchmen no peace but in their graves and they proceeded to make good their threatenings bands of confederates spread themselves about the region near montreal pouncing lynx-like from the forest upon any who ventured outside the immediate boundaries of the settlement for a time the people were in despair but the colony soon gained a breathing space not by its own efforts but from a diversion of iroquois enmity to other quarters about sixteen hundred and fifty two the confederated tribes undertook their famous expedition against the ares whose country lay along the south shore of the lake which bears their name and this enterprise for the time absorbed the bulk of the iroquois energy the next governor of new france de lauzon regarded the moment as opportune for peace negotiations on the hypothesis that the idea of waging only one war at a time might appeal to the five nations as sound policy a mission was accordingly sent to the iroquois headed by the jesuit missionary le moyne and for a time it seemed as if arrangements for a lasting peace might be made but there was no sincerity in the iroquois professions their real interest lay in peaceful relations with the dutch and the english the french were their logical enemies and when the iroquois had finished with the ares their insolence quickly showed itself once more the next few years therefore found the colony again in desperate straits in its entire population there were not more than five hundred men capable of taking the field nor were there firearms for all of these the iroquois confederacy could muster at least three times that number they were now obtaining firearms in plenty from the dutch at albany and they could concentrate their whole assault upon the french settlement at montreal had the iroquois known the barest elements of siege operations the colony must have come to a speedy and disastrous end as the outcome proved however they were unwise enough to divide their strength and to dissipate their energies in isolated raids so that montreal came safely through the gloomy years of sixteen hundred and fifty eight and sixteen hundred and fifty nine in the latter of these years there arrived from france a man who was destined to play a large part in its affairs during the next few decades francois xavier de laval who now came to take charge of ecclesiastical affairs in new france with the powers of a vicar apostolic laval's arrival did not mark the beginning of friction between the church and the civil officials in the colony there were such dissensions already but the doughty churchman's claims and the governor's policy of resisting them soon brought things to an open breach particularly upon the question of permitting the sale of liquor to the indians in sixteen hundred and sixty two the quarrel became bitter laval hastened home to france where he placed before the authorities the list of ecclesiastical grievances the governor a bluff old soldier was thereupon summoned to paris to present his side of the whole affair in the end a decision was reached to reorganize the whole system of civil and commercial administration in the colony thus as we shall soon see the power passed away altogether from the company of one hundred associates end of chapter three chapter four of crusaders of new france by william bennett monroe this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter four the age of louis quatorze louis the fourteenth the greatest of the bourbon monarchs had now taken into his own hands the reins of power nominally he had been king of france since sixteen hundred and forty two when he was only five years old but it was not until sixteen hundred and fifty eight that the control of affairs by the regency came to an end moreover colbert was now chief minister of state so that colonial matters were assured of a searching and enlightened inquiry richelieu's interest in the progress of new france had not endured for many years after 
the founding of his great company it is true that during the next fifteen years he remained chief minister but the great effort to crush the remaining strongholds of feudalism and to centralize all political power in the monarchy left him no time for the care of a distant colony colbert on the other hand had well-defined and far-reaching plans for the development of french industrial interests at home and of french commercial interests abroad as for the colony it made meagre progress under company control few settlers were sent out and they were not provided with proper means of defence against indian depredations under the circumstances it did not take colbert long to see how remiss the company of one hundred associates had been nor to reach a decision that the colony should be at once withdrawn from its control he accordingly persuaded the monarch to demand the surrender of the company's charter and to reprimand the associates for the shameless way in which they had neglected the trust committed to their care instead of finding declared the king in the edict of revocation that this country is populated as it ought to be after so long an occupation thereof by our subjects we have learned with regret not only that the number of its inhabitants is very limited but that even these are daily exposed to the danger of being wiped out by the iroquois in truth the company had little to show for its thirty years of exploitation the entire population of new france in sixteen hundred and sixty three numbered less than twenty five hundred people a considerable proportion of whom were traders officials and priests the area of cleared land was astonishingly small and agriculture had made no progress worthy of the name there were no industries of any kind and almost nothing but furs went home in the ships to france the colony depended upon its mother country even for its annual food supply and when the ships from france failed to come the colonists were reduced to severe privations a dispirited and nearly defenceless land without solid foundations of agriculture or industry with an accumulation of indian enmity and an empty treasury this was the legacy which the company now turned over to the crown in return for the viceroyal privileges given to it in good faith more than three decades before when the king revoked the company's charter he decided upon colbert's advice to make new france a royal domain and to provide it with a scheme of administration modelled broadly upon that of a province at home to this end a royal edict perhaps the most important of all the many decrees affecting french colonial interests in the seventeenth century was issued in april sixteen hundred and sixty three while the provisions of this edict bear the stamp of colbert's handiwork it is not unlikely that the suggestions of bishop laval as given to the minister during his visit of the preceding year were accorded some recognition at any rate after reciting the circumstances under which the king had been prompted to take new france into his own hands the edict of sixteen hundred and sixty three proceeded to authorize the creation of a sovereign council as the chief governing body of the colony this with a larger membership and with greatly increased powers was to replace the old council which the company had established to administer affairs some years previously during the next hundred years this sovereign council became and remained the paramount civil authority in french america at the outset it consisted of seven members the governor and the bishop ex officio with five residents of the colony selected jointly by these two beginning with the arrival of talon as first intendant of the colony in sixteen hundred and sixty five the occupant of this post was also given a seat in the council 
before long however it became apparent that the provision relating to the appointment of non-official members was unworkable the governor and the bishop could not agree in their selections each wanted his own partisans appointed the result was a deadlock in which seats at the council board remained vacant in the end louis Cator solved this problem as he solved many others by taking the power directly into his own hands after sixteen hundred and seventy four all appointments to the council were made by the king himself in that same year the number of non-official members was raised to seven and in seventeen hundred and three it was further increased to twelve at the height of its power then the sovereign council of new france consisted of the governor the intendant the bishop and twelve lay councillors together with an attorney-general and a clerk these two last-named officials sat with the council but were not regular members of it in the matter of powers the council was given by the edict of sixteen hundred and sixty three jurisdiction over all civil and criminal matters under the laws and ordinances of the kingdom its procedure in dealing with such matters to be modelled on that of the parliament of paris it was to receive and to register the royal decrees thus giving them validity in new france and it was also to be the supreme tribunal of the colony with authority to establish local courts subordinate to itself there was no division of powers in the new frame of government legislative executive and judicial powers were thrown together in true bourbon fashion apparently it was colbert's plan to make of the governor a distinguished figurehead with large military powers but without paramount influence in civil affairs the bishop was to have no civil jurisdiction and the intendant was to be the director of details the council according to the edict of sixteen hundred and sixty three was to be the real pivot of power in new france through the long years of storm and stress which make up the greater part of the history of the colony the sovereign council rendered diligent and faithful service there were times when passions waxed warm when bitter words were exchanged and when the urgent interests of the colony were sacrificed to the settlement of personal jealousies many dramatic scenes were enacted around the long table at which the councillors sat at their weekly sessions for every monday through the greater portion of the year the council convened at seven o'clock in the morning and usually sat until noon or later but these were only meteoric flashes historians have given them undue prominence because such episodes make racy reading by far the greater portion of the council's meetings were devoted to the serious and patient consideration of routine business matters of infinite variety came to it for determination including the regulation of industry and trade the currency the fixing of prices the interpretation of the rules relating to land tenure fire prevention poor relief regulation of the liquor traffic the encouragement of agriculture and these are only a few of the topics taken at random from its calendar in addition there were thousands of disputes brought to it for settlement either directly or on appeal from the lower courts the minutes of its deliberations during the ninety-seven years from september eighteen sixteen hundred and sixty three to april eight seventeen hundred and sixty filled no fewer than fifty-six ponderous manuscript volumes though in the edict establishing the sovereign council no mention was made of an intendant the decision to send such an official to new france came very shortly thereafter in sixteen hundred and sixty five jean talon arrived at quebec bearing a royal commission which gave him wide powers infringing to some extent on the authority vested in the sovereign council two years previously the phraseology was similar to that used in the commissions of the provincial intendants in france and so broad was the wording indeed that one might well ask what other powers could be left for exercise by any one else no wonder that the seventeenth-century apostle of frenzied finance john law should have laconically described france as a land ruled by a king and his thirty intendants upon whose will alone its welfare and its wants depend 
along with his commission talon brought to the colony a letter of instructions from the minister which gave more detailed directions as to what things he was to have in view and what he was to avoid in france the office of intendant had long been in existence its creation in the first instance has commonly been attributed to richelieu but it really antedated the coming of the great cardinal the intendancy was not a spontaneous creation but a very old and in its origin a humble post which grew in importance with the centralization of power in the king's hands and which kept step in its development with the gradual extinction of local self-government in the royal domains the provincial intendant in pre-revolutionary france was master of administration finance and justice within his own jurisdiction he was bound by no rigid statutes he owed obedience to no local authorities he was appointed by the king and was responsible to his sovereign alone from first to last there were a dozen intendants of new france talon whose ambition and energy did much to set the colony in the saddle was the first francois bigeot the arch plunderer of his monarch's funds who did so much to bring the land to its downfall was the last between them came a line of sensible earnest hard-working officials who served their king far better than they served themselves who gave the best years of their lives to the task of making new france a bright jewel in the bourbon crown the colonial intendant was the royal man of all work the king spoke and the intendant forthwith transformed his words into action as the king's great interest in new france coupled with his scant knowledge of its conditions moved him to speak often and usually in broad generalities the intendant's activity was prodigious and his discretion wide ordinances and decrees flew from his pen like sparks from a blacksmith's forge the duty devolved upon him as the overseas apostle of gallic paternalism to order everything as seemed just and proper even when this brought his hand into the very homes of the people into their daily work or worship or amusements nothing that needed setting aright was too inconsequential to have an ordinance devoted to it as general regulator of work and play of manners and morals of things present and things to come the intendant was the busiest man in the colony in addition to the governor the council and the intendant there were many other officials on the civil list both the governor and the intendant had their deputies at montreal and at three rivers there were judges and bailiffs and seneschals and local officers by the score not to speak of those who held sinecures or received royal pensions there were garrisons to be maintained at all the frontier posts and church officials to be supported by large sums no marvel it was that new france could never pay its own way every year there was a deficit which the king had to liquidate by payments from the royal exchequer the administration of the colony moreover fell far short of even reasonable efficiency there were far too many officials for the relatively small amount of work to be done and their respective fields of authority were inadequately defined too often the work of these officials lacked even the semblance of harmony nor did the royal authorities always view this deficiency with regret a fair amount of working at cross purposes provided it did not bring affairs to a complete standstill was regarded as a necessary system of checks and balances in a colony which lay three thousand miles away it prevented any chance of a general conspiracy against the home authorities or any wholesale wrongdoing through collusion it served to make every official a ready tale-bearer in all matters concerning the motives and acts of his colleagues so that the king might with reasonable certainty count upon hearing all the sides to every story that in fact was wholly in consonance with latin traditions of government and it was characteristically the french way of doing things in the seventeenth and eighteenth centuries louis the fourteenth took a great personal interest in new france even to the neglected times of things which his courtiers deemed to be far more important the governor and the intendant plied him with their requests with their grievances and too often with their prosy tales of petty squabbling 
with every ship they sent to versailles their memoirs often of intolerable length and the patient monarch read them all marginal notes made with his own hand are still upon many of them and the student who plods his way through the musty bundles of official correspondence in the archives nationales will find in these marginal comments enough to convince him that whatever the failings of louis the fourteenth may have been indolence was not of them then with the next ships the king sent back his budget of orders counsel reprimand and praise if the colony failed to thrive it was not because the royal interest in it proved insincere or deficient the progress of new france as reported in these dispatches from quebec with their figures of slow growth in population of poor crops and of failing trade of indian troubles and dangers from the english of privations at times and of deficits always must often have dampened the royal hopes the requests for subsidies from the royal purse were especially relentless every second dispatch contained pleas for money or for things which were bound to cost money if the king provided them money to enable some one to clear his lands or to start an industry or to take a trip of exploration to the wilds money to provide more priests to build churches or to repair fortifications money to pension officials the call for money was incessant year after year in the face of these multifarious demands upon his exchequer louis the fourteenth was amazingly generous but the more he gave the more the colony asked from him until the end of his days he never failed in response if the object seemed worthy of his support it was not until the grand monarch was gathered to his fathers that the officials of new france began to ply their requests in vain so much for the frame of government in the colony during the age of louis the fourteenth now as to the happenings during the decade following sixteen hundred and sixty three the new administration made a promising start under the headship of de mazy a fellow townsman and friend of bishop laval who arrived in the autumn of sixteen hundred and sixty three to take up his duties as governor in a few days he and the bishop had amicably chosen the five residents of the colony who were to serve as councillors and the council began its sessions but trouble soon loomed into view brought on in part by laval's desire to settle up some old scores now that he had the power as a member of the sovereign council and was the dominating influence in its deliberations under the bishop's inspiration the council ordered the seizure of some papers belonging to peron demesnil a former agent of the now defunct company of one hundred associates demesnil retorted by filing a dossier of charges against some of the councillors and the colonists at once ranged themselves into two opposing factions those who believed the charges and those who did not the bishop had become the stormy petrel of colonial politics and nature had in truth well fitted him for just such a role soon moreover the relations between mazy and laval themselves became less cordial for a year the governor had proved ready to give way graciously on every point but there was a limit to his amenability and now his proud spirit began to chafe under the dictation of his ecclesiastical colleague at length he ventured to show a mind of his own and then the breach between him and laval widened quickly three of the councils having joined the bishop against him mazy undertook a coup d'etat dismissed these councils from their posts and called a mass meeting of the people to choose their successors on the governor's part this was a serious tactical error he could hardly expect that a monarch who was doing his best to crush out the last vestige of representative government in france would welcome its establishment and encouragement by one of his own officials in the new world but mazy did not live to obey the recall which speedily came from the king as the outcome of this indiscretion in the spring of sixteen hundred sixty five he was taken ill and died at quebec he went to rest among the paupers says parkman and the priests serenely triumphant sang requiems over his grave but discord within its borders was not the colony's only trouble during these years the scourge of the iroquois was again upon the land during the years sixteen hundred and sixty three and sixteen hundred and sixty four bands of mohawks and oneidas raided the regions of the richelieu 
and penetrated to the settlement at three rivers these petites guerres were making things intolerable for the colonists and the king was urged to send out a force of troops large enough to crush the bothersome savages once for all this plea met with a ready response and in june sixteen hundred and sixty five prouville de tracy with two hundred officers and men of the regiment de carignan salier disembarked at quebec the remaining companies of the regiment making a force almost a thousand strong arrived a little later the people were now sure that deliverance was at hand and the whole colony was in a frenzy of joy following the arrival of the troops came courcel the new governor and jean talon who was to take the post of intendant these were gala days in new france the whole colony had caught the spirit of the new imperialism the banners and the trumpets the scarlet cloaks and the perukes the glittering profusion of gold lace and feathers the clanking of swords and muskets transformed quebec in a season from a wilderness village to a versailles in miniature but there was little time for dress parades and affairs of ceremony tracy had come to give the iroquois their coup de grace and the work must be done quickly the king could not afford to have a thousand soldiers of the grand army eating their heads off through the long months of a canadian winter the work of getting the expedition ready therefore was pushed rapidly ahead snowshoes were provided for the regiment provisions and supplies were gathered and in january sixteen hundred and sixty six the expedition started up the frozen richelieu traversed lake champlain and moved across to the headwaters of the hudson it was a spectacle new to the northern wilderness of america this glittering and picturesque cavalcade of regulars flanked by troops of militiamen and bands of fur-clothed indians moving on its errand of destruction along the frozen rivers but the french regular troops were not habituated to long marches on snowshoes in the dead of winter and they made progress so slowly that the dutch settlers of the region had time to warn the mohawks of the approach of the expedition this upset all french plans since the leaders had hoped to fall upon the mohawk villages and to destroy them before the tribesmen could either make preparations for defence or withdraw southward foiled in this plan and afraid that an early thought might make their route of return impossible the french gave up their project and started home again they had not managed to reach much less to destroy the villages of their enemies but the undertaking was not an absolute failure the mohawks were astute enough to see that only the inexperience of the french had stood between them and destruction here was an enemy which had proved able to come through the dead of winter right into the regions which had hitherto been regarded as inaccessible from the north the french might be depended to come again and by reason of greater experience to make a better job of their coming the iroquois reasoning was quite correct as the sequel soon disclosed in september of the same year the french had once again equipped their expedition more effectively this time travelling overland along nearly the same route it reached the country of the mohawks without a mishap the indians saved themselves by a rapid flight to the forest but their palisaded strongholds were demolished their houses set afire their caches of corn dug out and destroyed the mohawks were left to face the oncoming winter with nothing but the woods to shelter them having finished their task of punishment tracy and his regiment made their way leisurely back to quebec the mohawks were now quite ready to make terms and in sixteen hundred and sixty seven they sent a delegation to quebec to proffer peace two raids into their territories in successive years had taught them that they could not safely leave their homes to make war against the tribes of the west so long as the french were their enemies and the desire to dominate the region of the lakes was a first principle of iroquois policy at this time an armistice was accordingly concluded which lasted without serious interruption for more than a decade one of the provisions of the peace was that jesuit missions should be established in the iroquois territory this being the usual way in which the french assured themselves of diplomatic intercourse with the tribes with its trade routes once more securely open new france now began a period of marked prosperity tracy and his staff went back to france but most of his soldiers remained and became settlers 
wives for these soldiers were sent out under royal auspices and liberal grants of money were provided to get the new households established since sixteen hundred and sixty four the trade of the colony had been once more in the hands of a commercial organization the company of the west indies whose financial success was for the time being assured by the revival of the fur traffic industries were beginning to spring into being the population was increasing rapidly and the king was showing a lively interest in all the colony's affairs it was therefore a prosperous and promising colony to which the governor frontenac came in sixteen hundred and seventy two chapter four